So last week, as we were going through, we got in some deep water last week, amen? You know, the Bible talks about some simple doctrines, and it talks about some heavier doctrines. It refers to the milk, the sincere milk of the word, which is basically a message of salvation. It, the Bible also talks about strong meat. Now, there's a lot in between milk and strong meat. You know, when I think of strong meat, I think of like a, a T-bone steak that has some gristle in it, and, and uh, or a por I like porterhouse better than T-bone, but, but you know, you can't give a baby a bite of a, a porterhouse steak, they'll, they'll choke on it and you'll have problems. But you know what, when you become an adult and you grow in the Lord, you, you need some strong meat. You can't survive on just milk when you be, as you mature in the Lord. And, and our job as Christians is to mature in the Lord. That's our job. Paul kind of shared Corinth saying, at a time when I should be able to come and give you meat, I still have to give you milk because you're immature. You haven't grown. It's our responsibility to grow. And we grow in the church. But we also grow at home through our own personal Bible study and prayer to the Lord about about giving us growth, opening our eyes. You know, we've been talking a lot about, especially preaching on the spirit world, about blindness, spiritual blindness. And uh, we as Christians have a lot of, I don't know why I'm hanging on to this pen, but I am. We as Christians have a lot of, of uh, you know, blind spots in our Christian walk that we, sometimes through hardness of our heart, we don't want that eyesight. You know, don't tell me, I don't want to know. And uh, there was a church that, well, we never saw this, but a preacher friend of ours used to tell us about a gal that used to go to his church and should sit toward the back. And when he started preaching on something she didn't want to be accountable for, she'd literally put her fingers in her ear so she wouldn't hear. Guess what? You're going to be accountable for that. It was available to you. A preacher was preaching it. And you can't just plug your ears and say, now I'm not accountable because I didn't hear it. You're going to be accountable for it. And so... Uh, we got off at a rocky start last week, amen? Make me chase, question my uh, communication skills a little bit because everybody was kind of, it, it appeared from up here that everybody was kind of <laughs> lost. And so, but I think, look, I my finger. I think we, uh, <laughs> my coach over here. Um, I think we pulled it off towards the end because I started seeing light bulbs coming on and people were starting to get it. And I think it's exciting, not just as a pastor, but as a Christian when, when somebody's teaching a concept or a principle that's a hard one, and I'm struggling, believe me, there's been times, having sat under Dr. Ruckman, having sat under uh, Jim Motley, not Jim Motley, Jim, not Jim Motley's preacher, but Jim Motley's trained preacher boys, sitting under that kind of toolage with some deep doctrine being taught, there's times when I was scratching my head and trying to hold on for dear life and when that light bulb comes on, it feels so good that God gave you something, that God showed you something. And so um, I guess that's the good news about last week. Uh, before we get into this week's lesson, turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. And uh, we're in verse 12. We're going to read verse 12 and 13. It says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. These events that are starting to happen now are right at the end of the tribulation. Tribulation's about ready to be done. You say, wow, the tribulation's over and we're only in Revelation chapter 6. We'll talk about that. <clears throat> but the tribulation's about ready to end right here and now. And uh, the, the, the events connected with the heavenly, heavenly phenomena in the sun, the moon, the stars, they match the warnings of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. So look at Matthew uh, chapter 24. You can keep your finger in Revelation because obviously we'll be going back to it. But Matthew chapter 24 and uh, verse 29. Jesus is talking. He says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened 
and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Doesn't that line up with exactly what we just read in Revelation? The sun, the moon, the stars. And it says immediately after the tribulation. So the tribulation is right at its end. Because immediately is... So the tribulation in the book of Revelation, where we're at in chapter 6, is right at its end. Look at uh, Luke chapter 21. Well, let's go to Mark 13 first. I don't know why I have these out of order, but... We may as well keep them in order. Mark chapter 13 and uh, verse 24. It says, But in those days after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory, with power, with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost parts of the earth to the uttermost parts of heaven. So here you have the same events, right? The sun, the moon, the stars falling from the sky. So now look at Luke chapter 21. And these are the tribulation saints that he gathers? Um, it's more than that. We'll get to that. It's a great question. We'll get to that. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, or not Revelation, Luke chapter 21 and verse uh, 25. And there, be, be, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, man's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So, same events, right? Moon, the sun, the stars, the moon. Uh, look at uh, Acts chapter 2. And this is a, a place in the Bible where most Bible so-called scholars goof up. They goof up because this is a prophecy of something yet to come. It, isn't, it didn't happen here at this point of Scripture. So, um, Acts chapter 2 and verse 19 it says and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great notable day of the Lord come lines up doesn't it yeah. lines up so go back to Revelation now when we look at that bit in Acts 2, and I told you a lot of the scholars blow it with Acts 2. Acts, one of my favorite preachers used to say this book is a bear trap. And it is a bear trap. You got to be careful. You always got to know the context. You got to know what dispensation you're talking about. Or you'll get so messed up. And so Acts chapter 2 is one of those, Acts is a transitional book. And that's what goose most folks up in the book of Acts all the time. It's not the Acts of the church. It's not what the book's entitled. It's entitled the Acts of the Apostles. And so you have this transition going on between the Old Testament. How do you get saved in the Old Testament? Faith and works. Faith and works. It took works. You had to take your sacrifice in. If you didn't, you lost your salvation because the whole you weren't sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise in the Old Testament. That wasn't available until the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, you're saved by faith alone. No works. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're not going to get to heaven and have bragging rights about how good you were down here. It ain't going to work. So, <clears throat> Acts is a transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some of the things that the apostles were preaching in the book of Acts was foreign to them. Peter was just as surprised as the Gentiles when he first led some Gentiles to the Lord. They didn't think that it would be opened up to the Gentiles. He was shocked. They didn't know what was going on. And so here in Acts, the scholars grab this and, and conclude that Peter saying that the events prophesied in Joel 
are a reference to the first advent, when Christ first came here. And they're not. They're a reference to the second advent. And uh, many scholars fail to see that in the book of Acts, especially in Acts chapter 2, the kingdom is being offered to Israel right then and there. If Israel would have accepted the kingdom, there would have been no church age. The kingdom would have come, and it would have went right into the millennial reign, and there was no need. Every prophecy would have been fulfilled without having a church age. There's a guy out by the name of Clarence Larkin. He's not alive. He died in the, I don't know if it was the 1800s or, or early 1900s. But he wrote a book called The World's Greatest Book on Dispensational Truth. Now, Clarence Larkin was an engineer by trade, so he's a good artist. He could draw things really well. And he has all kinds of charts and graphs in this book that are just phenomenal. But one of the ones that always struck me was Mountain Peaks of Prophecy. And he showed the Old Testament uh, priest looking off into the distance of prophecy and he could see the first coming of the Lord. He could see the second coming. He, he could see the events happening, but there was a valley between mountains that was the church age. So if God would have came back because Israel accepted their Messiah in Acts chapter 2, all the prophecies of the Old Testament would have been fulfilled, and every jot and tittle of this book would have been met. But they didn't accept God. So this is where you get post-millennialism. They think that the events referred to in Acts chapter 2 were the first advent. And it's where you get millennialism. And that doctrine's wrong. That doctrine's wrong. So... <clears throat> Jesus could have come back for the second advent right there in Acts chapter 2. And there would have been those things that Peter said. What you guys are seeing is you're seeing, not we've already seen, you're seeing the fulfillment of the book of Joel. But they didn't accept their Messiah, so that prophecy still went off into the future. It never came to pass. Look at Revelation chapter 6 verses 14 through 17. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great man, and the rich man, and the chief captains, and the mighty man, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mounts, mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now, that portion of Revelation proves that Acts chapter 2 isn't talking about the first advent. Because if it was talking about the first advent, let's ask ourselves some questions. When did the day of the wrath of the Lamb come? Because that's connected with the second advent. When did all those people, the mighty man, the great man, kings of the earth, captains, rich man, bond man, free man, when did they all go hide in the rocks and the dens because they were afraid of the lamb? It hasn't happened yet. Uh, for that matter, when, when did the sun go completely black? And I'm not talking about a solar eclipse. I'm talking about completely black. You know what our picture of that is? The curse on Egypt when the darkness was so dark that you could feel it. You, you could put your hand right there and not see it. It was so dark. And that is a plague that the Egyptians went through. And when the Lord turns, comes back, he's going to turn that sun black. It's going to be dark. When did the moon become as blood? Don't give me this line about blood moons because that's not what the Bible's talking about. There's some, some fake scholars that have made a fortune off of writing their books on the blood moons yeah. and saying that the blood moon is a lunar eclipse. It's nonsense. The blood moon hasn't happened yet. And don't be, you know, don't be hooked by some 
uh, Wall Street guy trying to make a fortune off of some book. When did the mountains and islands move themselves out of their place? None of that stuff's happened, amen? Amen. And uh, when did heaven depart as a scroll when it's rolled together? Because all that's connected. All that stuff goes down at the same time, and it hasn't happened yet, so it's a future event. It's at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, not at the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the first coming, you had an attitude of, when Jesus first came, what was his attitude? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting, shall, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Gosh, I almost blew John 3.16. So what's his attitude going to be like at the second coming? Look at Isaiah chapter 63. I got blessed with the new Bible, so I'm once again dealing with pages sticking together, but it's a big print Bible, and it sure is helping. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Eden with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Who are we talking about? Jesus. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden in the wine press alone and of, and of the people there was none with me for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. For that day of vengeance is, is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And look, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And, when, and I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. A little bit different attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ between the first advent and the second advent, amen? amen? So, Revelation 6 takes you completely through the tribulation. Like I said, we're right at the end of the tribulation right now, and we're done with Revelation chapter 6. It takes you completely through the tribulation. The book of Revelation takes you through the tribulation four times. Four times. We're going to go through it four times. And that's not by coincidence because you have Jesus' account of what it's going to be in Matthew. <laughs> you have Jesus' account of what it's going to be in Mark. You have Jesus' account of what it's going to be in Luke. And you have Jesus' account of what it's going to be in John. So just like it's covered in the four Gospels, it's going to be covered four times in the book of Revelation. The first account is Revelation chapter 5 and 6. We just went through it. The second account will be Revelation 8, 9, 10 through Revelation 11, verse 15. That's going to be the second account of the tribulation. The third account is Revelation chapter 12, 13, and 14. And the final account is Revelation 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Notice that chapter 7 was enlisted. So now as we get ready to start Revelation chapter 7, i got to talk a little bit about Revelation chapter 7 before we get into it. Have you heard of a parenthetical statement? Do you know what that means? Okay, so there's some that don't know what that means. A parenthetical statement, if you look at a sentence, the sentence will be saying something, but to make the sentence clearer, they put something in parentheses and they give more detail within those parentheses and then continue on with the thought. God does that. Matter of fact, the church age is parenthetical. The time clock for Israel kind of came to the stop during the time of the Gentiles. And when God's done with the Gentiles, the clock for Israel is going to start right back up. So it's parenthetical. It doesn't change any of God's plan, but it fills in the gap. So Revelation chapter 7 is a parenthetical 
chapter in the book of the Bible. So what does that mean? That's why we got this illustration here. If you look here, you'll see kind of an outline of what we just went through in our lesson. We have the rapture of the church. Lisa drew all these bodies going up into heaven to be with the Lord. Amen. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, everything went up at the rapture of the church. The first seal was broken, which the, the white horse came out. The rider had on a one crown. The rider had a bow. The rider was conquering and to conquer. And the rider is an imitator. He's the Antichrist. He wants you to think that he's the Christ. He's coming in on a white horse and he's got a crown. I'm the Christ. He's not the Christ. He's the Antichrist. The second seal is broken. We have the red horse. And this takes peace from earth. There's going to be wars and all, all kinds of wars. And that they should kill one another. And it said he was given a great sword. And I went to some length to explain great does not necessarily mean good. You know, it's a great tribulation. It's not going to be a lot of good. There's not going to be Easter egg hunts. It's not going to be a fun time. It's not going to be picnics. Then the third seal was broken, and it was a black horse. And he had a pair of balances signifying that food's going to be rationed. And he had famine and, and the rationing of food. And he, he was told to hurt not the oil and the wine. And we saw that that had two applications, amen? amen. The rich folks aren't going to be impacted too much by the, by the drought and the famine because they'll find a way to get theirs, amen? amen. And also, uh, the oil and the wine is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the Spirit. So the fourth seal had the pale horse, and that rider, they gave us his name. It's the only rider that they gave the name, and his name was Death. And hell followed with him. Now, hell and death are not the same person, because hell followed with him. And power is given to him to kill. He's going to kill a quarter part of the earth with a sword, with hunger, with death, and with beasts. Amen? Amen. Everybody with me so far? We have the fifth seal open, and under that were the souls that were under the altar. And those are the folks that were beheaded for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, they were slain for the word of God and their testimony. And they were asking for judgment and for the Lord to avenge them of their blood. And they were given white thrones and they were told white they robes. got, what's that? Robes. That's what I said, they were given white robes. I said thrones. Oh, did I say thrones? White robes, not white thrones. They were given white uh, robes, but... Um, Oh, and, and they were told that they had to wait for a time because there was others that had to lose their life the same way they had lost their lives. Then we come to the sixth seal. Got a great earthquake. The sun is black. The moon is as blood. The stars fall to the earth. That's not, you know, Orion's belt falling to the earth. That's angels. The demonic angels are coming to earth. And uh, I can, we didn't go into detail on that, but I can show you in scripture where angels are referred to as stars. I can, and if, if you guys want me to, I'll do that next week. Anybody want me to go through that so you can see that? Okay. Okay. So, uh, the stars fall to the earth. Heaven is departed as a scroll. Mountains and isles are out of their place. And the rich hide. Now, the Lord says we're coming back with him to whoop up on the earth. And I hope I get to go in those holes and dig out some of them rich folk. That'd be fun. <laughs> Be, that's just my flesh, but that'd be fun. <laughs> Watching the terror in their eyes as they shoot me and it doesn't harm me. So we, there's seven seals. If you remember when we first started the book of Revelation, I went through the list of all the sevens that there are. And there's seven seals, seven vials, seven trumpets. There's all kinds of sevens in there. Well, we only got through six seals. Now we're going into chapter seven. And the seventh seal doesn't happen until chapter 8, verse 1. So what chapter 7 is, and I hope this is crystal clear, it's parenthetical. There's things that are going on simultaneously at the same time that seal 1, seal 2, seal 3, and seal 4, seal 5, and seal 6 are being opened. And so in parentheses, God's going to say, okay, all this stuff happened, but this was going on too. 
So we're not continuing on with the seventh seal yet because God's going to give us more light of what was going on during the time period that these seals. So is that as clear as mud to everybody? That's what I mean when I say it's parenthetical. It's, it's, it's not, uh, what's, it's well, additional I, information. It's additional information that's taking place at the same time. And a lot of people get lost because they think this time has gone by and now more time's going by with Revelation chapter 7. No. Chapter 7 is a continuation giving more detail on what's happening during this time. It's not linear. What's that? It's not necessarily linear. It isn't linear, but you know what? Time is only to humans. God isn't, God isn't constrained by linear time. So we're going to look at Revelation chapter 7. Now, now it dawned on me while I was up talking and pointing at things and such that, that uh, and I know I do it all the time, put my hand in my pocket when I'm preaching, I'm not supposed to do that. I, I don't care. I'm going to be comfortable. And I'm comfortable with my hand in my pocket. So if that irritates you, I'm sorry. So <laughs> it didn't dawn on me. When I'm saying up there, then it was obvious because there's no pulpit blocking it. But, and I know when I was going through Jim Motley's classes, he'd tell me I can't do that. But Jim, I can too do it. I do it all the time. <laughs> Amen. We'll pray for you. Yeah, that, that's probably a better thing. Just pray for me. So, Revelation 6, 12 through 17, the tribulation is over, and the wrath of God is still coming. Is The day of his wrath is, is, is still coming. But when we get to Revelation chapter 7, it, that story doesn't go on. That's the whole thing about it being parenthetical. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about 144,000 Jews getting sealed. Amen? Amen. Uh, so Revelation 7 is telling us something that takes place during the six seals. And chronologically, the seven seal is going to take place here. In, so let's look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. It says, and after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, to me, <clears throat> that in itself is a, is, a, is a plague. I don't know if you've ever been out on a summer day when there's no breeze at all, but there's normally like 15 billion flies associated <laughs> with that. It's nasty. There's nothing that's cooling your perspiration. There, there's this happy medium for humans that makes it just right with wind. There's a point where, man, it's too windy. I, we need this wind to stop. But there's also a point when there's no wind at all and it's miserable. Back in the days when ships were powered only by sails and they'd come to some weather where there was absolutely no wind and they had to sit stationary sometimes for weeks out in the middle of the ocean the sun pounding down on them, no movement at all. It was, it was terrible. So we're not going to look real deeply at this verse, but suffice it to say that Bible rejectors, this is one of the verses that they go to, and they say that the Bible's not scientific. They say it talks about four corners of the earth. So the Bible's teaching that the earth is flat. It's archaic. It's going clear back before... <laughs> Columbus's time because we're round. There's not four corners on the earth. But nothing could be further from the truth. This book is so far ahead of science. This is the best science book that was ever written. It's the best history book that was ever written. It's the best book on future events that was ever written. It's the best book that was ever written. And every subject that it covers, it covers in greater detail with more specificity and more facts behind it than any other book that was ever written. Darwin's theory of evolution doesn't even qualify to be a theory. If you understand science and understand what a theory is and what a, what, it doesn't even qualify to be a, a, theory. a theory. Before it can be a theory, it has to be a hypothesis. And Darwin's theory of evolution, scientifically speaking, barely meets the criteria of a hypothesis. And it never developed into a point where it could truly be called a theory. Even Darwin himself said that within the next few years, if we can't find fossil evidence to back this up, my theory will crumble. 
guess what? They haven't found any fossil evidence to back it up even to this day. Amen. And people always talk about the missing link. It's not a missing link. It's missing links. Yes. There's millions of links missing. All the in-between phases are gone. There's no record of them anywhere. Yet you have fossil evidence that shows that there was a sudden explosion where there was nothing and now all, all sorts of life form exist. Like it was created in six days or something. Hmm. It was. So nothing could be truer further from the truth. You know the Marine Corps I don't know if you've noticed something about the Marine Corps. They always do. They can't give it up. Her dad's a former jarhead. And they got to have Marine stuff everywhere. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about, don't you, brother? Yeah, once a Marine, always. No, you're not. You're an old man now. You're not a Marine anymore. You got to have that because your dad ever happened to listen to yeah. it. It really offended him. <laughs> but the Marines used to have a recruiting po poster that stated, Uncle Sam's Marines are serving the United States on the four corners of the earth. You think the Marines thought the earth was flat? When someone's referring to the four corners of the earth, they're talking about north, south, east, and west. That's the four corners of the earth. Pastor? Yeah. Mathematically, if you look at it mathematically, the earth is a sphere that is spinning. So at any point in time, what was a point here, which was north, west, south, is now moved over, and that plane has shifted, and it continually shifts. Yeah, amen. So it, make, it makes a sphere of north, south, east, and west. Amen. So but you know what? The Bible knew that the world was round. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. Just got to prove it real quick. I mean, they want to grab something. They want to take it out of context, but they're just God-haters, and they're Bible-rejectors. And the, the Bible's the best science book that was ever written. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22. It says, It is he that sitteth on the circle of the earth. Huh. He knew it was round. And the inhabitants there are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So the Bible knows that the earth is round. When it's talking about the four corners, it's talking about north, south, east, west. The Bible is always, always, always ahead of man's science. You need, to, you need to know that. If you give science enough time, they'll eventually catch up with the book. Mm, probably not. Probably not. So go back to Revelation chapter 7. Uh, verse 2 and 3. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God, of our God, in their foreheads. So you got an angel that's coming down with a seal, and he's going to be sealing some folks in their foreheads. This is still during the tribulation. We're not around. We're not going to get that seal in our forehead. We're already gone. So there's somebody coming, some angels coming down, and, and there was power given to some to hurt the, the earth and uh, the sea, but they were instructed not to hurt the earth and the sea because we got to take care of God's servants first. That's the whole idea. So, this should be enough just in this point so far to show the parenthetical nature of, of Revelation chapter 17. Satan is a counterfeit of everything Christ. Amen, he does. I mean, God puts a mark on these folks' heads. And Satan puts a mark on foreheads and hands. Yes. He tries to counter the Antichrist is a counter. Amen. Amen. So we saw when we were looking up here during these seals, we saw that all hell had broke loose, remember? We saw that in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 15, but that doesn't happen until this remnant of Israel is sealed in their foreheads. Because if you remember, it said, touch not, the, told, told them, touch not those that have the seal of 
God in their foreheads. So this had to happen before that could happen, when all hell broke loose. Is everybody with me? I haven't lost anybody yet? Okay. So <clears throat> these things are happening simultaneously. God's given more detail that while these things are, it's just like in the book of Job, folks. Satan couldn't do anything to Job that God didn't say, go ahead and do it. And you'll notice that if, you've, if you think back when you read the book of Job, when Job would go to the Lord and ask him if he could do something, when Satan would go to the Lord and ask him if he could do something to Job, and if God would agree, Satan never even said thank you. I mean, it says, and he departed and immediately went and smote Job. He was so excited to go do that. These demonic things that want to cause harm, they're just chomping at the bit. They want to get this thing going, but the Lord reigns in and says, whoa, you got to wait. It's got to go in my timing. Got to put my seal on my, my servants. So you see in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, it says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now we're going to jump back and forth between Revelation uh, 7 verses 2 and 3 and Revelation chapter 4 because this verse, Revelation chapter 7 verse 4, it's a loaded <coughs> verse. This is a verse uh, that, that also demonstrates that this book is a great big bear trap because there's a lot of cults that have grabbed this verse and they've run with it. And they twist the scriptures, just like it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. We're not going to go back and read that. But it says that they uh, rest the scriptures, the same form of wrestling, they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. And that's what these folks are doing. There's a problem with what these churches are saying, and it's a little problem called private interpretation. Look at at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 It says, knowing this first. This is the first thing you need to know. Right? Isn't that what it says? Yeah. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. You can't grab a, a Scripture and make it a private interpretation that benefits you. And churches do that all the time. They do it all the time. So in this verse, you have a group of churches, you have Mormonism, you have the Seventh-day Adventists, you have uh, the, what's that? The Jehovah's Witnesses. They all grab hold of this verse. When somebody goes outside of what the Bible says and builds a theology outside the Bible, but profits their unique little group of followers, watch out. That's called a private interpretation. Bible believers knowing the doctrine of private interpretation over the centuries have labeled such groups as cults. When we see a group that goes off on their own little tangent and they're doing private interpretations of the Bible, we label them, Bible believers, that's a cult. Stay away from it. And uh, once when I was witnessing to somebody close to me and showing them the truth about the Bible and about salvation, he made the statement, you should be very careful. You're betting your soul on this. I said, yeah, I am betting, but you know what? You're basing your soul on whatever you do too. <laughs> We're all betting our soul on whatever we decide to do. I want to bet my soul on the Lord Jesus Christ who is perfect. I don't want to bet my soul on my ability to be good. Gosh, I know what a piece of crap I am. I hope I'd have lost points. Yeah. <laughs> I know what a knucklehead I am. Amen? Amen? I don't want to count on me. I blow it. I'd be going to hell. 
I want to count on somebody who's done it for me. I want to count on somebody that had the ability to do it for me. I want to bet it on somebody that had the authority to do it for me. That's what I want to bet it on. We're all betting our souls every day. Stuff doesn't seem to be working too good tonight. I don't know what's going on. I'm not lost, I just can't get the page turned. How we just get any grief tonight. So here's the whole thing. I don't want to bet my soul on some book that didn't even show up till the nineteenth century. <coughs> God didn't leave the whole world in darkness until the 19th century. Um, I uh, don't want to bet my soul on a book that can't be archaeologically proven. You know, the Book of Mormon, they've spent millions and millions of dollars trying to go in and find archaeological proof to what's written in the Book of Mormon, and they haven't found anything yet. And you don't think the Mormon, church, the Mormon church is one of the richest churches in the world. You don't think they've invested some money? Because I'd love to just say, look, this proves our book. You've never seen a commercial for, you see a commercial for Mormonism and it's how good we are to our family. You never see a commercial of Mormonism that says, look, we have found proof that the Book of Mormon is real. Because they haven't found proof. And they never will find proof. You can't carry water in a leaky bucket. I wouldn't want to bet my soul on that. God's finished his work when he finished the New Testament of the Holy Bible. There's not going to be any new prophecies. We got all the prophecies we're going to get. There's not going to be any new testaments or new books written that take the place of this. This is what God gave us and that's all there is. And the Bible warns us time and time and time again about adding to it and taking away from it. We're going to look at those. We've done it before, but it's good practice. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. It used to be that when, when a Christian was trying to deal with a, um, a Mormon, trying to disprove their Book of Mormon, they would say, look at Revelation, and we're going to look at Revelation, but look at Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, which say don't add to this book. Yeah. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And um, verses 1 and 2. Now, har now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So you go, if you take a Mormon to Revelation chapter 22, they'll say, that's just talking about the Book of Mormon, where it says, I'll add to your plagues if you add to it, and I'll take away your part out of the Book of Life if you take away from it. They'll say, that's just referring to the Book of Mormon. That's nonsense, because it's throughout the Bible. Here you see it in Deuteronomy. Don't add to it, don't take away from it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse uh, 32. It says, What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. You can't add to it, you can't take away from it. Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6. Verse 6, 
Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We're not supposed to add to it. We're not supposed to take away from it. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. We're going to talk about this some more on Sunday, so keep these verses in mind. Don't forget them. I don't want to go through and read them all again. So keep them in mind for Sunday. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18, it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So it's a common theme throughout the Bible. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. The words of God are pure. They're perfect. They're, they're purified. They're, it's finished. Man always thinks that they can outthink the book. You can't outthink the book. You can't do it. It's physically impossible. You can't outthink the book. This is God's word, and even when you change it, you didn't change it. Amen? You either take people to hell or you take people out of fellowship with God if you change it. Stop and think about it. I want that to soak in. If you change this word, you're either taking people to hell or you're taking them out of fellowship with God. Don't change it. I know. Do what it says. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Amen? So, folks whether they're Mormons, whether they're Seventh-day Adventists, whether they're Jehovah Witnesses, or any other group that want to twist the scripture and have a self-righteous attitude and believe that they can be good enough to justify themselves before a perfect God, come on. Yet the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Amen. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. The Bible says all live sin and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, Wherefore by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death has passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You know how I know everybody sins? Die. Everybody dies. That's the wage of sin, is death. There's only been one person... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> There's only been one person that didn't die. Who was it? Who? Enoch. Some people go, the Lord Jesus Christ. Nope, he died, but he rose again. So why would anybody bet their soul on their ability to be good when you look at what the Bible says to, has to say about our goodness? I'll bet my soul on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says he's the only begotten of the Father. He has no brothers and sisters. Amen. He's an only child, and if it were, and he is an only child, and he's the only way. No matter what they believe, where they live, or how they raised, or how they were raised, they can't get to heaven without Jesus Christ. What about folks that are raised in a Muslim country? If they don't find Jesus Christ and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're going to hell. What about the heathen in Africa? If they don't find Jesus Christ and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're going to hell. Now, the Bible does teach the principle of where there is no law, there is no transgression. So if somebody knows nothing about any law, they'll go to heaven when they die. That takes care of all the little kids. That takes care of folks who are mentally handicapped. And it takes care of people that have no chance of ever. But you know what? A Muslim can't say they haven't heard that there's a God that expects things out of you. No. Because they hate the God. Well, they, they think that God is um, Allah. But um, you got to have Jesus. There's no other name given among man whereby we must be saved. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. No other name.